Marco, Sarah, how the hell are you guys? Great. I'm good. I'm so ready to rock out. Yeah. <laughs> this is a podcast a long time in the making. You let, let me let me just fanboy out for a second, okay? <laughs> you two are two of my absolute favorite entertainers at the comedy spot. And um Sarah, Sarah more more new to, to me than than Marco, right? But when I, I back many years ago, because I've been going to the comedy spot for like five, six years. Yeah. And um, Marco always on the cutting edge. And we were going to see him in his underwear. Like, it was just like, <laughs> oh, that's you're awesome. Laugh and you're going to see a grown man in his underwear. And just so many memorable sketches that you were a part of that just are etched in my brain. Uh, but probably my favorite one was um where the, uh, the the stormtroopers who let luke and obi-wan go in the infamous these are not the droids you're looking for yeah so they're being they're being questioned afterwards and they're reviewing the body cam footage and they're, they're yeah. saying, no these were the droids you were looking for and they're like no they were not the droids we were looking yeah. for like yeah they were still under do you, do you remember that sketch yeah, no, that yeah, that one. Uh, uh, who was it? Derek wrote that. Derek Don Down. Derek Down wrote that. And yeah, no, we love that sketch. We got to do that uh, at, a, at a at a West Sac Sci Fi show, like convention, and like the entire place like lost their shit over it. Like it was amazing. <laughs> it was yeah, that's a really funny sketch. The only disappointing thing is we couldn't get a stormtrooper costume. Uh, so I think Josh does it, and he has like a children's stormtrooper costume. <laughs> but the but the center of it is was split. So he uh -huh. can fit it. And so there's like white duct tape over his crotch. It's a very odd, like it, you, if you don't see it, nobody notices it, but it's just bizarre. It's like, he's like, is he wearing a diaper? Why does he have that? <laughs> and it's just this weird thing. But yeah, no, that's awesome, Jesse. I had no idea. I, I have I have had maybe like, w like two people ever be like, I saw you in a show and it was awesome. And I was like, whoa, what? No, uh So that was like amazing. Oh, it's no. That you actually <laughs> saw them or remembered them. And, so. and and Sarah kind of, kind of very, very new to my universe is Sarah. And um, I just remember uh, they, uh, the telenovela team was sending me names of people that we should invite to rehearsal. And it was, I was getting, I was getting really overwhelmed with like, I, I don't know this, I don't know this person, I don't know this person. And I would just go to their Facebook profile and I would glance them over and I was being, I was being very, very picky at that point. It was like who I was going to let into this inner circle of this thing that we were trying to build and really, really cared about and were kind of having some success with. And I was looking at Sarah and I was like, oh, doctor, check. Oh, <laughs> university, check. Oh, Garce is high. What the hell? Yes, go Rams. And then I was like, yeah, Sarah, just everyone else is gone just send sarah let's go uh, let's do this and well i will never forget that moment when jazz asked me that my name had come up and i had just finished all the classes for improv we were just starting hypothetics i definitely felt very insecure and had a lot of imposter syndrome and so when she asked me that my name had come up and would i be interested and i had seen your i had seen your stand-up and i saw you on acl and um, I can't remember if I knew that you were from Bakersfield or not. Like, I know you made a joke about Bakersfield, but I didn't think I knew at the time that you were from Bakersfield until we kind of bonded about it later. But I just was so flattered and so honored that even anyone even thought of me because I felt like such a nobody, nothing within the comedy spot community. So, and then telenovela was just like blew my mind in terms of how you guys were doing it because I'd seen a show. So I just, I am so glad that you welcomed me into your orbit because it's been so much fun. And I've learned so much. And then also I love that there's someone else from Bakersfield that can like love that and hate it. on our shared city. Yeah, that uh, gets we like, are allowed to do that. Yeah, that gets how happy we are to be in Sacramento. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And I'm gonna take a moment and fangirl for Marco a little bit. So yes, do it. Marco, I, I didn't know anything about Sketch until I took Sketch 101 online at the beginning of quarantine. And then I wrote a sketch and then Brian had suggested that I submit him when um, when you guys were kind of accepting sketches. Right? Yeah, we didn't yeah. know what was going to happen. And so Sarah told me, I heard you might have something from Brian. 
we love to read it. And so I sent kind of the one sketch that I was the most proud of, which was the dino dinner party. Um, and I, months later, I ended up getting your guys's feedback and everyone had their initials and I saw MC and then I just was so, I can't even tell you, I was so excited that anyone even bothered to read my like <laughs> puny little sketch, the first time I've ever really written one. And you guys had just the most wonderful feedback. And so when I saw the feedback coming from you in particular, I just was so like, oh, that's, okay, cool. like that's good. Like, all right, you did something kid. Like, good job. Like Marco <laughs> approved. That's awesome. So thank you. I that's see amazing. you guys as like kind of my, the Friday show is the epitome of kind of sketch writing and sketch comedy. So <laughs> Yeah, oh, cool. Matt, good, good stuff. See, we're 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 yeah, all so much love. Yeah, <laughs> I, I wanted to have both of you guys on a podcast forever, and I I just wanted. Oh, and I know Marco. I shot you messages maybe back as far as like a year and a half ago, yeah. saying let's let's do something sometime. But stuff just keeps moving, and and yeah. I don't yeah. ever. I, I got to put something up every week, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And uh, I was, I finally like this kind of. Sarah fangirled out one day about Def Leppard, and I was yes. like, "What?" That was where I was like, "I was like, what? Oh, <laughs> well." Well, and then the day that you sent me that message, no joke, I was just working out and I was listening to my Def Leppard playlist and just having the time of my life. And I had just watched it was some, we had just done the like best albums or something. You had done something. You always post about music on Facebook, and we were talking about it amongst the three of us. We had this ongoing thread. And for this moment in my head, I was like, you know, that would be really fun to just, I didn't even think about a podcast. I just thought about us getting together like for shits and giggles and just yeah. talking about 80s music. And then I get to my phone after the workout and you had messaged the two of us and said, would you like to be on this podcast? So, I mean, it was meant to be. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. You're, you're Jesse, you're my favorite music person to see you yeah. post stuff about music at all. And I'm always like, <laughs> this is great. And I'm always, it's like the best thing to see that you're like, you always got your the records. You always do. I love it. Yeah. And so, yeah. And then, uh, uh, so when you mentioned this and you did mention it something like once before or twice before, and I was like, oh yes, that would be amazing. And we, and, and so this is super exciting. Yeah. Is, I'm super yeah. excited. Uh, and and you, for yeah, us. yeah, the stuff that you post about music, same, same thing, Marco. And well, the stuff that you do like about music and movies and um, yeah, just kind of like, like your, I don't know your your pop culture isms. Like I'm I'm with it. I'm here for it. Not yeah. all of it because I'm not a gamer. You know. Right. 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 But uh, yeah. But so anyway, we got to we're getting together today to discuss the top five hair metal albums of the '80s. I made the topic super specific, hoping that it would help keep us narrow-minded. <laughs> I think it, it was, it, it, this, this topic, it just kind of goes because you're like, what's hair metal? What's heavy metal? What's this glam metal? And so I said, dude, feel free to just put what you, what did I say? If they wore makeup and hairspray, yeah. um, I'm going to call it hair metal. Um, there's a couple bands that I, I was like, it broke my heart to leave them off the list, but I feel that there's a, a better, bigger podcast just for them down the road. I don't know. We'll see how it goes, but we're just going to go down the list right now. We'll start now and let's talk about uh, the five albums that we each came up with for this list. Are we, are we good to go? Questions, comments, concerns? Yeah. Do you want us to just start with number five and discuss? Yeah, yeah. we're going to start with you. Ladies first. We're going to go five, four, your five, Marco's five, my five, your okay. four, my four. Okay. Okay, sounds good. So All to right. preface my list, the way that I thought about this, because I agree, it was very overwhelming and daunting. There's so many kind of iconic 80s metal, hair metal, glam rock, all of that. There's so much. And then you have to, and then you get into the nitty gritty of like their albums. So the way I thought about it was I imagined if an alien species were to come to earth and to say, what is this 80s music, 80s metal that everyone talks about, right? Like, what could I encapsulate? And if I only had to give them five discs to take with them to kind of begin to understand that generation of music, what would be those five albums? So that's what helped me in terms of really narrowing it down. So my number five, though, and I went back and forth with another one, so I might mention it in my honorable mentions, um, is also not controversial, but it just barely counts. So I had to go with, even though I don't consider them glam metal or anything, but they definitely are 80s metal, was I wanted to have Metallica on the list. 
Mm. And um, then when it came down to, it's like, okay, I have to honor the fact that Metallica is 80s metal. I don't consider them hair metal. I don't consider them glam rock at all. But which of their albums most resonates with me? So this is the part that I cheated a little bit, but I, I ran this list by my brother, my oldest brother, who influenced a lot of my musical taste, and he approved, so I feel okay about it. But I actually chose their 1991 self-titled album or the Black Album because, number one, it had a lot of emotional ties for me. They had a lot of amazing singles that came from it. And when you think about what was kind of the most relevant in popular culture as well, and pop kind of pop rock-ish, I guess, and that was accessible to people without it being super kind of esoteric metal that some people, some metal heads knew about, but most people didn't. I feel like that album is really kind of was the bridge to the rest of the population and trying to like digest what Metallica's music was while still honoring the essence of their music. So that's why I chose that album. On top of that, I have vivid memories of rocking out with my air guitar as like a nine-year-old, my brother babysitting us and just like headbang. I learned how to headbang to enter Sandman. So I just feel like I had to put this album on my list, even though it was technically not 80s, but they existed and were very big in the 80s. And I think also the thing I love about Metallica is their music is very consistent. So they have gone through you know, at least two and a half ish decades. And I feel like if you listen to their music from the eighties and in the nineties, they kind of changed with the time, yeah. but I do have to give them credit for really of all of the bands staying the tr most true to who they are and what their sound is and kind of not being apologetic for it and not trying to be something that they weren't. So they morphed without kind of leaving their true identity. So that's why they're my, they're my number five. That album is my number five. I, I think the, the picking up where you're leaving off about like what, how they've stayed true and like they, they've morphed, like there's Metallica albums that you can listen to and there's Metallica albums that you're just like, eh, they were going through a phase, but right. there's not one Metallica tour that you're not, hmm, well, how much are the tickets? Where are they going to be? Like when they go on tour and they play their, their history, you still want to see it, right? Yeah. Regardless of what you thought of the album that came out six months ago, 18 months ago, like you, they, they have this catalog of hits and influence that, yeah, I see it. Um, I just recently picked up that record. Uh, Walmart did reissues and um, and I went and I, I, was, I was like, which one do I want? Because I didn't want them all. And the, I was really torn as to like which one I wanted. And that's the one I settled on. And, and I don't oh, regret nice. it. Yeah, I, I think Kurt Hammett is one of the best guitarists alive right now. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, the 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 black album was one I, I definitely played at like as a teenager. Like that was right. one of the ones I had. My my uh cut uh, was my uncle gave me a, and my brother each like his all of his Metallica CDs because of Napster. Oh like, yeah. Because he got mad at because they were he he liked Napster and Metallica was was like no and so he was like I hate this band now and so he gave <laughs> us the CDs. So I had that one and I had Master of Puppets and I don't remember the third one I had but um but yeah no that one I listened to the most as a as a teenager for sure. And yeah Metallica is always interesting to me because they uh I I always thought of them as like they they're they're kind of the one that that yeah like where the mainstream like at that time was like oh this is this is what the 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 the, the that music the heavy metal music is that's what those kids are and, and so they right. broke into the mainstream without all with, with in a way that people interpreted as like this is this is what it is and they didn't uh, even though they supposedly are, are like sold out or whatever with that one because they worked with right. like bon jovi's producer uh but yeah that was the one definitely that that we all that everybody listened to and Inner Sandman was the biggest thing ever that, that, right. that period of time. Yeah. I mean, it's, it was the gateway album, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. gateway into that, Definitely. which is why, and if you're a true fan, you know, and there was a lot of people discussion about like that isn't even their best, but mm -hmm. you know, I also try to think about, well, part of a band's success also is the more that they can get their music out to the masses. Right. Um, and people who wouldn't even ordinarily listen to that music, if you're able to even tap into that, I feel like that's, worth kind of celebrating and commenting on in terms of what they were able to do, right? Because if you're going to be so holed up in your own, you know, genre and just be like, well, we're just only going to be this and screw everyone else. Well, you know, that's unfortunate. That's as close-minded as, you know, as the opposite end of the spectrum. So anyway, so that's why I started out slightly controversial, but I had to just pay homage to them. And if I was going to, that was the album that I felt like 
deserved, you know, the aliens should hear, know what that album was. I, I dig it. I dig it. Awesome. All right. Marco, you're number five. Yeah, I can do that. Kind of like Sarah. I, uh, what I did was I, when you were like, let's do hair metal. So I was like, all right, I can do that. And I put together a list. I was like, this is my hair metal list. And I was like, ah, I kind of just learned that I like hair metal. I like a lot of it and I'm into a lot of it. And I buy a lot of hair metal albums. I listen, but if I'm making like a kind of like Sarah said, if I'm like, Hey, what, what is the eighties metal? Like, what is it? Like if I was to kind of encapsulate it, I was like, well, these aren't, these aren't my list. Like if I was to even just be like, what are the top 10 metal albums of the eighties? There's um, probably like one hair metal album on there. The most of them are going to kind of be hair metal adjacent. Mm-hmm. And that was why it was like learning like, oh, what the hell is hair metal? Like, is it just the hair? Is it just people with hair? Like, is it, the, <laughs> is it? And then it became looking it up. It was like, no, it's glam metal. It's like, they're, they're trying to emulate T-Rex and David Bowie type stuff. Yeah. I'm like, oh, hey, Annabelle. Um, and I was like, well, okay, let's, uh, but does that include like Quiet Riot? Everybody seems to put them on their hair metal list. They're not hair metal. They're, they're like metal. And it was like, so I just was like, okay, I'm just splitting the difference. I'm going to do all of the most awesome 80s metal and the most awesome hair metal. And I'm just putting them all in there. Nice. So my number five for doing that has to be uh, Twisted Sisters Stay Hungry. That is a badass album. I am a huge Twisted Sister fan. It's a... Uh, <laughs> They're, they're a weird ass band though, because like, they're just a joke. Like, you're just like, oh yeah, it's that guy, that weird looking guy who has like lady makeup on. Yeah, <laughs> hell yeah. But the thing is like, it's like, they they were like an amazing, like kind of like, like rock band in the seventies, basically. Like they drew a huge audience all by themselves uh, 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 and became this big thing on their own. And then they went in to make an album and the first album is like just dripping in 80s bullshit that doesn't fit on like it's like the big epic drums like the stuff that would be good later but does not fit them and then and then by this one though they they nailed how to how to sound right and it's a really good album yeah because by the time they recorded this album they had already been playing together like 10 plus yeah. years right like yeah. they were already like a solid core yeah, no, their band, they were like, they were like a legend on like, like, I forget where, like on some East Coast place that's like where they were like were huge. They had a huge fan following and then they got like a, a minor record contract, I think in England, I might be getting that wrong, but it was like with a smaller label and they kind of like, like didn't have the best, like getting out there to a wider audience. And this, of course, is the one that has the big, the big hit songs on it, the, the we're not going to take it and I want to rock. Uh, but the whole album is damn good, and it it uh, it has a bunch of uh, it sounds great too. That's the thing they kind of figured out like this is the right way to have them sound to to make it uh, yep the, the correct. I don't know how to describe it, but eighties metal, you know. And that's what I look like if a, if the band has like big drums and awesome guitars, I'm like okay, I'll listen to this. I don't care about the rest of it. Like and but but Twisted Sister needed a specific kind of way to sound to not sound horrible, and they they nailed it on this one. So yeah. yeah. The great that was awesome awesome stuff okay uh let's see my okay my number five uh and i, I think you guys both kind of touched on it like there's 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 albums there's songs and there's videos that you see that are kind of like your gateway into like well what is this all about and it, it kind of it grabs your attention for the first time and with me definitely um Growing up, I was not really into heavy metal. I was more like into like what was on the radio, uh, like pop, like hollow notes, you know, the police, all that stuff. Um, but uh, what's it called? Oh, Rat Out of the Cellar is, yeah. my, number, oh, is my number five. Rat Out of the Cellar. Um, the the video was crazy. I, I just rewatched the video for Round and Round, like the big hit single was mm-hmm. Round and Round. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen the video, but like it, it's it tries to tell a story. Uh, Milton Burrow is in the video and he plays kind of like himself. And then he also plays a female that he's kind of like hitting on at this dinner party that's going on. It's a crazy video, but uh, yeah, rap out, out of the cellar. And here's a bit of a uh, pop culture history. This is a uh, Tanya K- Tani Katane, who is the dancing girl in the in the White Snake video. The White Snake. That's what oh, I was going to say. The lady on the hood of the White that Snake. That is her. <laughs> At this point, she's dating Rat's guitarist. So she was always she's always into um, 
into musicians. And uh, yeah, so at that point, she was dating Rats guitarist. And it was uh, sold four, how many million? I thought I wrote it down. Sold three million copies. So uh, it was kind of a big album uh, for being a, a metal, hair metal album at the time. So yeah, that's my number five, 1984 Rat Out of the Cellar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. Okay, uh, Sarah, what's your number four? Okay, so again, along the same theme, um, I, 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 this is also hard. I feel like one, two, and three were really easy. Four and five were really hard for me to figure out which ones were going to make the list. But I had to go a little bit basic, but that's okay. I had to go with Bon Jovi, Slippery When Wet. Ooh. I think that, I know, it's hard. And so he technically counts, at least if you, when you do the research, he counts as kind of like glam metal, I guess, mm -hmm. but really kind of more pop, right? And again, this also made, um, that particular album has all of, you know, the big hits that most everyone knows and everyone does karaoke too, right? You Give Love a Bad Name, Living on a Prayer, um, Wanted Dead or Alive, um, you know, but in general, as I listen to the whole album all over again, there's a lot of really great songs on it. So again, it was music that kind of made, became more accessible and really, I think, became a part of pop culture. Um, but on top of that, I just always, I, as a person, I also really like John Bon Jovi, yeah. a lot of his philanthropic work. Um, I just really respect him as an artist. Um, I really like their band in general. And so, you know, a little bit, again, is going to go into the more X factor part of why, what is it about the band that I like? And that also he has done a really good job of staying relevant through the years, right? So the band formed in what, like 82, 83, um, right. or at least when their first album came out. Because this was like their third album, right? Yeah, yeah. So they've been around and then, um, but you know, but even if you think about it, I mean, he launched himself into cinema, right? And so now he's just kind of a pop icon. Um, and I think that that is really the test part of being like a longstanding kind of famous person is how are you going to continue to stay relevant to generations that don't even know who you are, that don't relate to your music, but will relate to you in a different way. And I think he's done a really good job of that. And on top of that, I think he's just a good person. And I like the philanthropic work that he's done. Um, and, you know, it's just from regardless of those singles, it's just a great album. So I, I gave him I gave him number, gave the Jersey Boy uh, I, number four. Spot. I'm so glad that you put this on your list because I was like, my heart wanted me to put this album on the list. Um, I loved it. I, I saw them when they came to, to Sacramento a couple of years ago and it was like the best show. But mm -hmm. when you're talking about like how he stayed relevant and he did all the work he did, the Young Guns 2 soundtrack is one of the greatest <laughs> yes. soundtrack albums of all time. It's so good. But um, yeah. That's a great record. I'm so glad you put it on your list. Thank you. All right, Marco, what do you got at number four? No, yeah, look at, looking through all this stuff, it was like kind of going over like, oh, what do other people put on these? How do they categorize, like just trying to figure it all out. I, it was one of the things I thought about was like, oh, wow, all these people are just terrible assholes. Like mm -hmm. they're just awful people. Like, because not like a, they're rock stars. Rock stars, like right. that's just how. But not Bon Jovi. He was like the one I was like, no, he's a he's a nice guy. Yeah. And and that, yeah, I'm super glad that that one definitely deserves to be there for for hair metal. Uh, again, like uh, for my number four, because I was trying to split the difference between hair metal and and kind of how Sarah said, uh, like 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 I have to present an alien with with eighties metal. <laughs> My uh, my number four one was the one I kind of I, I, I definitely kind of uh, was like, no, I have to give you a dissertation on this alien when I when I give it to you, which is uh, it's not, I don't it probably doesn't count as hair metal. But uh, for 80s metal, my my like I love this is is Black Sabbath's The Mob mm -hmm. Rules. Black Sabbath I, I, is like one of my my music obsessions is Black Sabbath in the 80s because Ozzy Osbourne left. And then they they had they have had a total of five singers that recorded albums and they recorded all of them in the eighties. So they have all these weird eighties hair metal albums and and the Bob Rules is not their hair metalist album. I think uh, Headless Cross is or something. They have a couple of weird ones that are they're out of print and are really good. But the Mob Rules is probably my favorite, maybe my favorite like band doing something. It's my favorite metal of, of like music of the eighties. There's a song on it called Sign of the Southern Cross. Uh, that is probably my favorite 80s metal song. So I was like, oh, I, can't, I can't leave it out just because they probably didn't use hairspray, but they did have silly hair. I mean, Dio's got silly hair. He was the singer on this one. And I was and gonna say who, so this is a this is a Ronnie James Dio era Sabbath. Yeah. 
he he recorded two albums in the early 80s recorded the probably the one that should be more well remembered which is heaven and hell that's usually the big one and uh-huh. then he recorded the Mob Rules the next year, but I like the Mob Rules better. It's uh, Silent Southern Cross is made. Every song on that album is is awesome. And, man. and did you say you like the, this? Was your favorite variation of the Sabbath band? This is my favorite variation. Yeah, no, I, I uh, even even if I I like Ozzy albums, uh, and I like I I don't I'm not a big fan of Ozzy himself. I find him a I like Ozzy and I would put like like some of his music up pretty high on there, but I, I find him incredibly frustrating as like a, a person because he's, I, he's like, I, I only love uh randy rhodes era ozzy oh yeah 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 no no that's good stuff no he uh yeah. uh, uh and that those those two albums are really good mm-hmm. and, and ozzy makes fine music actually through the 80s to me he just he himself and sharon are kind of skeevy about it like they screw over musicians and 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 they like like ozzy's like a weird lie he's like a, a doddering goofball like we all know that by the time he had a tv show Right. But like that's him the whole time. Somebody else writes all the music, and then they screw that person out of the money and and pretend Ozzy wrote it. Like the guy after uh, him, Jakey Lee, got completely screwed out of everything. Like like he wrote all the songs for I think ba- Bark at the Moon, and they were like, "Yeah, you can try to sue us, but we're rich, and uh, we're gonna claim Ozzy wrote all these songs." And bye. Oh, wow. And uh, same thing with the, the his bass player. They're the same thing. It was like Bob Daisley, I think his name is. He wrote all the lyrics to all the Ozzy albums. And there was like a locked up fight they had where you couldn't get some of them they, uh, from the 80s because they were out of print because he was uh, counter suing them or something saying he wrote that? a bunch of songs. Yeah, yeah. A, uh, yeah it's, I mean, the whole, it, it, it's very specific. Uh, they're all like, you know, uh, Axl Rose is probably like a giant horrible person but I, I still like it like you know so it's kind of all over and it's it's inconsistent how you get mad at people but uh anyway black sabbath 80s <laughs> black sabbath in the 80s with dio is like maybe my favorite band ever like just just straight up so I is put rudy him on there. Sarzo in that band what's that was rudy sarzo in that band rudy sarzo was in was he in quiet riot who was he in i know that name He's in, uh, uh, he wasn't in uh, 80s Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath uh, had, what they have? They had, uh, that was when the Mob Rules is, uh, Vinny Apice is the drummer. Uh, Tony Iommi is always the guitarist in all forms of Black Sabbath. And then Beezer Butler is the drummer or the bass player. Uh, and I think that one, I don't remember. He, I don't think Rudy Sarzo recorded with Black Sabbath. Oh, I think, okay. He was like, it's a hired gun on tour or something. I think he did. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rudy Sarzo, I, I th- I, I'm thinking he's in Quiet Riot, but I'm probably wrong. What was he in? Uh, I'm going to look it up. I'm like, I have the internet. Just about to look it up while you guys are now, now it's just going to be like this. This is what I'm now doing. I was like, what, what was Rudy Sarzo in? <laughs> yeah. Oh, look at that guy. The list is going to be long. Oh, Sorry. you're right. He's on. He was Ozzy Osbourne's. Okay, okay. Quiet Riot. He was in Quiet. That's yeah. He was in Quiet Riot. Yes. Ozzy Osbourne and White Snake. Oh, okay, okay. Man, sorry, oh, yeah. sorry to put everybody down the Rudy stuff <laughs> there for a second. It's one of those oh, no, things like that once two... it's in there, you have to like, you have to see it through. You have those to figure it out. Selfish <laughs> names. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're gonna move on to mine number four. Um, oh. This, if this isn't 80s hair metal, I have like at least one on the list that no one is going to argue. Oh, this is 80s hair metal. No, I think I have two. But uh, 1983, Poison, open up and say, ah. Oh. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Dude, sold, yeah. Six million, sold 6 million albums. It had a number one single with uh, Every Rose Has Its Thorn. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two album. It, it reached number two on the pop charts. And oh my god, I went such a I went down such a rabbit hole trying to figure out what kept it out of the number one spot. And the Billboard Hot 100 albums is not the most user friendly website. <laughs> George Michael's Faith kept uh, this album out of number one <laughs> in uh, June of 1988. <laughs> so I had to say that because I spent <laughs> at least 20 minutes trying to figure out what kept this out of the number one and it had uh the singles nothing but a good time uh fallen angel i love that video for fallen angel um mtv was a huge influence on on all of the artists that i was even considering for this list um and of course uh every rose has a thorn and oh here's something interesting it was produced by this dude named tom warman who produced a lot of uh, like that 80s metal sound. But originally, Paul Stanley from Kiss was supposed to produce it. But uh, 
he ended up having to, to pull out of the project because Kiss was going back on tour. And so they had to find another producer at the last minute, but it ended up being a huge album, six, six million copies. That's a lot. So yeah. that's my number four, uh, Poison, open up and say, ah. Yeah, that's a good that's choice. A good I, I would put, yeah, that was on my short list. Uh, yeah. was the oh, was it? Okay. Part. I love yeah. it. That's a great album. Yeah. I remember I had the I had the, the cassette single for Every Rose Has a Storm, and I used to just rewind it and play it, rewind it and play it. And yeah. You know, uh, and they're Christmas. still really good performers, too. I think that's yeah. the other thing. I saw them at Santa Barbara Bowl when they opened for Def Leppard. This was like in 2012. And I, you know, I'd never seen Poison live before and they, you know, I just was really impressed that they still knew how to work the crowd and they knew that, you know, both bands knew like they're old, right? They're all middle, you know, beyond middle age now. And they just did a great job of like, they still had that like youthful energy and like were were able to bring the crowd in. They were a fun band to watch. Nice. Santa Barbara Bowl is such a great place. Santa Barbara Bowl and the Greek in LA are just a couple of the most beautiful places to see a show Agreed. awesome okay sarah you're number three all right so i was just listening to this this morning as i was making my breakfast so um my top three i'm the most excited about and so i had to pay homage to van halen and i chose 1984 i feel like i i just I, there that is probably for me their most iconic album um and you know all of their great singles came from that that's still like I listen to it and I just like get up and go right jump Panama hot for teacher like just so much fun great I mean 2020 took took Eddie from us which was just such a heartbreaking loss um for like the world of metal but I just think it's a great album it's so iconic for the time um, even if you weren't really into it. And they're, again, they're apparently classified as being glam rock, but I don't necessarily consider them to be glam at all. I think that they're just a really great rock band. Um, and I love how like Van Halen has brought in, like there's the two brothers and then later on he brought in his son, um, you know, until they eventually, once he got his cancer diagnosis and they kind of, you know, officially then disbanded, but um, you know, they're just, they're just great. The sound, I mean, and there's always, you know, the David Lee Roth and like all the like, Yes. The vocalist drama, but at the end of the day, I'm like, I don't even think about that anymore. I just loved their sound and their sound kind of carries over. Um, and I mean, they were just great, great music, just objectively. So I was, um, yeah, I just kind of went down a nostalgic route and immersed myself into Van Halen this morning. So they got my number three with 1984. Marco, where, where are you with Van Halen? I like, I'm a big fan of Van Halen. Uh, uh-huh. They were like, uh, I listened to Van Halen in uh, high school a lot. And uh, I think I had like a greatest hits of theirs and where, where David Lee Roth came back. So it was like mm-hmm. late nineties, maybe, or early 2000. I think it was probably late nineties. Uh, so I listened to them a lot. And uh, yeah, and I had a uh, 1984, I didn't get like an album. I think somebody at my, one of my first jobs gave me like a burned copy of 1984 on CD. And that was when I first actually listened to the album, but I, I, I do like Van Halen quite a bit. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, when, when Eddie passed, it made me um, like, uh, you know, I went down a YouTube rabbit hole, of course, that night. And it made me finally, when, when the whole Van Halen, when the whole David Lee Roth, Sammy Hagar thing happened, like the fans at that time, it seemed like you, you had to make a choice. Like right. you either had to be like, you know, you were, you were down with David Lee Roth or you were down with what they were, we were calling Van Hagar, right? Yeah. <laughs> and of course, I was Team David Lee Roth, so it was really, um, and when when uh, when Eddie passed, that I really went down for the first time down the Van Hagar rabbit hole, and I was like, you know, Eddie just kept getting better and better and better, and the whole thing about Sarah, like you said, that you're not sure if you want to call it uh, hair metal or glam metal, but. Van Halen definitely gave birth to the the LA sound that would eventually end up being like that Sunset Strip sound. And it was Mm -hmm. all because Van Halen got signed, started making millions of dollars. And now all of these musicians flocked to LA to be the next Van Halen, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing that with that, I feel like I unfortunately got lost. And it's exactly that the, the, their sound never changed, right? There was all the bullshit about the, the vocal, right? Sammy Hagar mm-hmm. and Jamie Lee Roth. And, I'm, and 
it's just, it was just stupid. Now in hindsight, when you go back and you listen to it and you're like, their music was still really good. And it was yeah. good because they're like instrumentalists were amazing, right? Like the Van Halen brothers were amazing guitarists. Like they just, so then you were just kind of like, well, who cares, right? They're, and it was stupid because I remember that split and I was very young and I didn't understand it entirely. But I remember listening to their albums in the early 90s and they were they were good, right? Even with Sammy Hagar, like they were fine. But at the end of the day, it was still like the music was just good. And so yeah. it's unfortunate that there ever was any of that kind of bullshit because it really took away from their sound, which hadn't changed, in fact, because their band, the band was solid. Yeah. 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 And I, think, I never. Oh, yeah. Uh, go for it. And I think if we if we unravel the bullshit even more, um, we'll see that it was even back then it was just fucking media hype it was just like yeah. oh yeah the guys at rolling stone the guys that spin the guys that needed yeah. something to write about so let's write about this um yeah. instead of just rolling with uh, this is another evolution of this of this great it, band of musicians it also is like one of the just more famous examples of it i mean there's every uh a whole bunch of bands replaced their singers at various times yeah. a whole bunch of things like the the idea that like i always liked both of them and never was like I think because I I I I I don't like I probably didn't listen to them till later, so I heard it already happened, and so it just part of the history. But I always heard it as like a thing, and it kept being a thing for like the next twenty years. Like, oh, David Lee Roth's kind of come back. Isn't it going to finally be good? It's like I guess, like <laughs> yeah, who yeah. cares? Yeah. Uh, I mean, and I'm sure it's it, he did fine, but yeah, the Van Halen's an interesting band because it's like what you said. The the thing at the beginning, their late their first album is amazing, and that's like the one that like. Right. blew up and it was like oh this is a thing right yeah i yeah. wish i'd done this you're you you were smart enough to do it i'm like I, they're I out of reach and i don't think they're organized enough to find them oh I was the, like, this I got, took this took a long time last night <laughs> i was like i should have done it i got it i got that rat one i can find it and then, <laughs> yeah. uh, the, but no that yeah the van halen that first one the influence of that because that was what i learned looking up all the hair metal stuff it was like I would read lists of like, well, what are all these people putting on these? And they would put all these ones I wouldn't have thought of as hair metal because they include all this stuff in the early 80s where they're like, oh, well, this band made it. And then, like I said, Quiet Riot made it or Twisted Sisters become it. And it was like, these are kind of that. But I'm thinking like like Cinderella, like ones that have goofy yeah. hair, or like, right. like Poison is clearly hair metal. Right. Um, but it, yeah, no, no. Van, Van Halen. Van I, Halen. I yeah. Good, good one, Sarah. Good one, Sarah. Yeah. Marco, what do you have at your number three? Okay, number three, like I said, I was splitting the difference. I have five, so I couldn't go, like, I was going to be uneven. So the, the album that splits the difference exactly on the line is Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, it, you just lump it in there. It either gets lumped in with just a metal, 80s metal album or an, a hair metal, because they're the LA or LA scene band. They're the biggest one. Mm -hmm. it's the most famous one of all of those those sort of like la bar scene whiskey a go-go type bands that popped up and uh you know it's the it's the classic listen to it forever you know when you're making a top five list you end up with the ones that you're like you know how you're gonna keep talking about abbey road or something it's like <laughs> yeah but you know everything's been said it's cool it's a, yeah. it's a good one. no i get it and i was i was torn i i probably lost an hour's sleep last night of like whether or not i wanted to put guns and roses on my list and uh i read a great article that said um you know all the other they, they said if uh if nirvana was the final nail in the coffin of hair metal guns and roses was the first nail in the coffin of, oh. of hair metal and said that where all these other bands uh, had these these songs where they said don't be this bad boy don't be this bad girl don't go down this road in life guns and roses gave you the first person perspective of that person that all these other bands told you not to be right. and um uh, you know like my michelle that song is not a pretty picture uh <laughs> even rocket queen as loving as it is it's like you're putting each other through hell like it's it's such a great record and yeah i could do a whole podcast on guns and roses because the, uh, they just they just meant so much to me over the years and then when they when they got back together regardless of what the lineup is and if you want to call that guns and roses or not like oh yeah no so i i could i could do an entire if you were doing podcasts i could i could do multiple hours on chinese democracy 
I, really? I had like an obsession with Chinese democracy. I had like all these bootleg songs from it. I was like super excited about it. I bought multiple copies the day it came out. I, I was like, I, I, I kind of love Chinese democracy. I, and I find it the so, most fascinating album. I liked, so I bought Chinese democracy the day it came out and I, I loved it, but it's like, I had to learn to not like it because nobody else liked it, but I was so happy when the, what I obsessed over the Guns N' Roses tour and I was checking the set list every night before I would go to bed. If I knew they were on the East coast, I was like, Oh, the set list will be up by now. I'm going to yeah. check the set list. Um, and if they were on the West coast, I'd have to wait till morning. But when I saw that they were doing better from Chinese yeah. democracy, that is my absolute favorite. That's probably one of my top five favorite Guns N' Roses or Axl Rose pinned songs. I, I just love that song so much. And uh, that ended up being really what, like when I think of Chinese democracy now, like that's really all I can remember of Chinese democracy is better. But I remember that guitar, those guitar solos were. Oh my God. Yeah. Insane on the yeah. whole album. Yeah, no, no, that whole album is amazing because it has guitar solos. Like, well, because it's at a time when you don't see that uh, as much. Like, I'm sure there are bands that do amazing guitar solos, but like, you don't see it at all in the same way. And, and Guns and, and uh, Chinese Democracy, it did seem to be, we are definitely putting the most blistering, amazing guitar solos we can possibly put into uh, this this album. So yeah, yeah no. And and the, that record took like, I don't know, like he recorded, it, did it take like 10 years to record? It, was, it is a, four, it, I think it cost $14 million and it took from like 1997 or something or 90, like they started it, well, I don't remember when their last album was, but it's 97 or 90, I think it started in 99, it didn't come out till 2008, because that's when it came out. Man, yeah. Can you turn that, my water off on the stove? <laughs> that is that is a, a crazy record, and yeah, no, yeah, but yeah. But yeah. So I'm glad for our you list, though, I was gonna say, say Guns and Roses. You're probably right. Nail on the coffin. End of hair metal. But uh, is it like? Do they count? Do they not count? Like, are they? No, no, but definitely on I was, my list. Yeah, I saw I saw some pub, I saw some publicity shots of Guns and Roses, and they looked very pretty. They, their hair yeah, that's was, true. Their hair was immaculate. Well, that's the thing. I, they, I think it's a, it's, it's like a style. Um, yeah. You know, like like the style at the time also was that. So there wasn't. They don't have to all look like the the like like poison or yeah. like look what the cat drug in or whatever. They they could. So everybody had a poofy perm, even yeah, if they're just no, the bass player or the other band. Axel Axel was definitely wearing makeup in the Appetite for Destruction video, and there was plenty of hairspray. So yeah, I'm calling. Yeah. They belong on the list. I'm glad you did it. Thank you for being <laughs> thank you for being braver than I was. Uh, okay, number my number three is uh, one that's already so we're, this is the first time it's happening, and I'm wondering if it's going to happen more as we get uh, further down the list. But my number three is also Twisted Sister, uh, mm -hmm. Stay Hungry, uh, because this just was another one of those gateway videos for me of like. The videos were so hilarious and they were on MTV and just uh, later on uh, they got another rebirth uh, when they 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 played their song in that movie Road Trip with Tom Green. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. I that. That. They're on the bus and he plays I Want to Rock and they and the, they have yeah. like this. It got a resurgence then and uh, it ended up on a lot of uh, on a lot of mixed CDs that summer. And yeah. Twisted Sister, Stay Hungry. There's a great documentary about Twisted Sister that I recommend if you could ever track it down. It's so good because he, they talk about that whole, when they were, how the they were. The set. I wanted to watch that, yeah, because I, I was under the impression they went through all the stuff in the 70s because I've read about them in the 70s when yeah. they were just, where they would play like two songs in a concert and they would just like talk to the audience and the audience was totally into it. Like there's yeah. all this crazy stuff that Twisted Sister did before they, they, if you look at them now, it's just like, ah, eh, it's a joke. It's that guy and he's dressed like a lady and that's it. It's like, yeah, <laughs> no. Yeah. D Snyder is something else. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Sarah. Okay. You were excited about number three. How excited are you about your number two? Okay. So we're going to go back a little bit because my number two is actually Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction. <laughs> so, um, and you know, 
there was so much that I, there's things that I knew about Guns N' Roses. And then again, like I said, in my deep dive in the last month, I watched VH1's Behind the Music, which you can still find on YouTube about Guns N' Roses, which, you know, the documentary is only as recent as like the early 2000s. Um, but, you know, like they, I agree, they just kind of epitomized that Sunset Boulevard, uh, like, 80s LA like birth of like their version of rock and roll right and kind of made it that glam rock and so I totally agree that it is it is hair yes exactly it is <laughs> it is hair metal it is glam rock they totally bought into it and if for nothing else Axl Rose played into that so much right like he was such an asshole to the band right yeah. and like <laughs> you know like yeah of course that's exactly I hate to say it, it totally even characterizes the personality of unfortunately Sunset Boulevard in LA, right? It's all about <laughs> your image and it was all about, you know, yes. what you were, it was, he was so selfish, right? And this band, well, the two bands that came together to create Guns N' Roses, they were both separately very good, but then you hear like Slash and like genuinely, like they were a good band and it makes yeah. me almost like angry. Like he elevated them, right? There was that je ne sais quoi that he brought to the band, obviously that made them what they became, but it's unfortunate that that was also part of their demise, right? Yeah. And then, and then when you think about really like sex, drugs and rock and roll, all of these bands had that, but I think they're the ones that celebrated it the most, right? Unfortunately, it made it sexy and made it seem like it was cool to be you know you know passed out drunk and you yeah. know with like your groupies like on your jock and like all that stuff like that's who I that's the band that I think of so I absolutely agree that they're like 80s 80s, 80s hair metal and glam rock they played into it that's what made them popular and their music was very good but man Axel was an ass yeah he's I kind of love it though like I want him to be that all the time he's the only he he's like, it. Yeah, he's like one of the only people that if you're like, oh, Axl Rose, he's like 56 now or whatever old he is. And he's just like, oh, he trashed a hotel room. I'd be like, yeah, that's right. He should do that. I'm yeah. okay with this. Like if, if, if like Vince Neil does it, I'll be like, stop being a jerk and grow up, Vince Neil. You're getting old. But it's on brand, right? It's on brand for Axl Rose. So you're just yeah. kind of- It's just actually he drives around his Ferrari and he's a jerk to everybody. Okay. Yeah. yeah, being a rock yeah. Star. I, I've gone through my, because I love Guns N' Roses so much. Uh, I remember- I, I I broke up with Axl Rose, finally, finally, this abusive <laughs> relationship. I finally broke up with him when he did not um, get the band together to play for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Mm. I'm like, you know, the Talking Heads played together. The Police played together. Uh, Credence mm. did not. Uh, yeah, but they're not like, <laughs> Yeah, but so like, I was like, that's how low you're going to sink. You're going to sink to the Credence level, Axl. All right fine i hate you like but then yeah. when he got guns and roses back together again for the not in this lifetime tour i was like take my money go ahead take yeah, my money yeah. um i i saw them twice on that tour once in uh once at at&t park and then the other here at golden one and God. was it on time did they did they start know, right? late oh no uh, no and you didn't even know when it was gonna start and every night <laughs> was like that it was like no opening act you just sat there like the ticket said eight o'clock <laughs> Yeah, and you just sat there. It's so, <laughs> and it's so arrogant, right? And like, sat there how disrespectful to your fans. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's so funny. Good yeah. stuff. That's awesome. Awesome. Marco, what do you got at number two? All right, continuing my, explaining the difference, showing this to an alien. If I was to give an alien one single album to be like, this is what metal music was in the 80s. Like, this is this is my representational one. That is going to be I think it's like from 1983, if I'm getting it right, which is Judas Priest screaming for vengeance. God. I love Judas Priest. They're one of the, I saw them recently. I took my kids to see them. And, and they were like, this is amazing, Dad. And uh, 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 Rob Halford's like 70, and he still kills it. Uh, and, but Screaming for Vengeance is the most awesome 80s metal album. It starts off with the best opening track to any 80s metal album ever, which is Electric Eye... Uh, whatever the hell it's called. Uh, I, I didn't write it down, unfortunately. I was supposed to remember that. Uh, um, <laughs> but uh, um, but yeah, no, that, that that album through and through, beginning to end. I don't know. It's pro I don't, I don't, it probably doesn't count as hair metal because I think they made one hair metal album that's re usually reviled by their fans called Turbo, which I also love. 
but uh but it's if i'm yeah if i'm giving someone this is what it sounds like that that's the album it's so good and it has a badass eagle on the album cover that's the, so okay that's the one like the, the album cover is black and like the the eagle's gray right or something like yeah. that. yeah okay oh i had thrown down my number two the, yeah, screaming for, oh screaming for Vinge. okay 1982 is when it came out yeah and it has it has you've you've got another thing coming on it oh that's the big that's famous the they're probably the their most one. famous song yeah and so that kind of fits in with all the other 80s ones but it yeah the first song is called the hellion and electric eye and it's 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 a badass guitar solo and the whole album is great and uh yeah no that's a if i'm yeah if i'm saying hey you, you want some 80s music it's a it's yellow actually it's got yellow it's a yellow album cover and it's got a big metal eagle on it the one that's okay. black it has like a weird ass it has like a weird demon thing on it that's uh defenders of the faith and that one is also really really good J judas priest 80s albums are great i heard that uh rob halford's autobiography that just came out is amazing um, i want to get it i am such a fan of him just uh -huh. as a person he just lives in arizona and and takes pictures in cat shirts and 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 lives his best life and i i love him so yeah much. he's 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 awesome and uh I think it's something that I, that I definitely want to pick up uh, somewhere down the road. And maybe I, 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 it's, it's one of those biographies that like, when I see it for like five bucks somewhere, I'm going to buy it, but yeah. I'm not going to run out and pay $20 for it. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if I, if I see it somewhere, I'm going to pick it up. Um, yeah, he's, definitely. Had, he's, he's, yeah, he's definitely one of those guys that's had the rock star life, gone to rehab, done all kinds of crazy shit, seen some things. Yeah. yeah. And, and they've been around forever. Yes, I think since the early '70s. Right. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, my my number two, uh, dude. <laughs> I this band. I think I switched records on them three times. This was the third record that I was like, okay, it's gonna be this one. No, it's gonna be this one. No, it's gonna be this one. Um, the whole L.A. Sunset Strip sound. L listen to this, you guys. Between 1981. In 1989, Motley Crue drops Too Fast for Love, Shout at the Devil, Theater of Pain, Girls, 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 and Dr. Feel Good. Uh, like two, two years apart. Oh, yeah, each one of the 81, 83, 85, 87. Finally, in 89, they got sober and dropped Dr. Feel Good. But uh, I'm picking 1985's Theater of Pain. Um, because it had the ballad that drew me into like really, really, really liking them um, was uh, Home Sweet Home. Uh, and what does he say? Dude, he says, I had to run away high so I wouldn't come home low. And these guys, like the, the debauchery that M Motley Crue uh, did, there's a story that they were supposed to play uh on the green in oakland and they they went they had to get tommy lee out of a hole was it no not tommy lee was the drummer yeah. nikki six nikki six the bass player the guy yeah they had to take him. they had to go find him at a, at a hotel room in la fly him to the show wake him up carry him to the stage do the show and then fly him back and he was just man the um his biography, The Heroin Diaries, is it's harrowing. Um, I would I went through a phase where every time I'd go to Barnes and Noble, I would pick it up and like read a chapter, and then I would just like, oh, like I'd have to go put it like it was like it was like reading from like an evil book of like that you weren't supposed to be reading, and then I would go put it back away. And uh it's Molly Crew uh to me, man, like. I, I liked them early with like Shout of the Devil and of course like the Girls 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 album and even like the Dr. Feel Good. I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, I wanna I wanna just mention this really quick. The the Sunset Strip sound, like it was so crazy, but it also like the aftermath of the sunset, like without the without bands trying to emulate what that sunset sound was. And then it being like regurgitated and like murdered and killed and just redone in the aftermath of that sound or, or during like in the last last breaths of that sound, that's where we got Jane's Addiction and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. 
And I think right. that that it's that sound is so important because like how Sarah was saying, like how these bands keep evolving. Well, that sound kept evolving. Right. And the Red Hots, I know they're really funky and they're really heavy, but they wouldn't have gotten that that rocking, that that those trash can metal sound if they weren't somehow trying to emulate that sunset sound. And Jane's Addiction, man, that talk about like glam or me, like talk about like what is it like is it glam is it metal is it alt it's like it's the aftermath of that sunset strip and i just wanted to give a, a shout out to them really quick because the this hair metals era gave birth to that and those are two great bands of the 90s yeah motley crew definitely was on my honorable mentions and yeah. just because there's so there's too many to to like be able to fit into like a list of five but, um, but yeah, I like, at the end of the day, I had a hard time, I, you know, once I grew up and I kind of listened to a lot of these songs again, like, man, these are really misogynistic, <laughs> <It was> hard, <laughs> really hard as a, a self-actualized woman to like come to terms <laughs> with the music that I grew up listening to that I didn't understand when I was younger. So for that reason, I, I struggled with Motley Crue, but I agree that they were a great band. <laughs> And that that LA Sunset Strip sound is like kind of its own. You're right. I mean, and even when you go back, like I when I lived in LA, I went to a couple of live shows, um, like at Whiskey Go Go, and I can't remember a couple other places. And it was weird to be there and to be like, oh my god, like these bands that I grew up listening to, like played on that stage, right? And like, what if the band that I'm listening to is going to be, you know, in five years, like they're going to make their big break because this is where they all started. Yeah. So there's just something about that sound that it, you're right. Like we don't give it enough credit that it bred all like this next generation of how rock evolved. So anyways, but yeah. So we're, we're on to our number one. So you kind of said that Motley Crue was kind of like one of your also runs did before you do your number one, do you want to mention a couple of albums that you were just like, Oh, no, I want to, but just that you want to, you want to give a couple of words to? Yeah. Yeah. So the other bands that were kind of on my honorable mentions were, you know, I was debating where to put Motley Crue. I was debating where to put ACDC. Um, and then honestly, I really was debating, but they don't count as the genre. So I couldn't, but I loved Aerosmith. Um, but they were very much, you know, I, I don't consider them eighties metal at all. Right. They were really classic rock. They just, they also had a lot of momentum through the 80s and even I would say the early 90s um you know and actually a lot of the 90s um and so I just it was more that they're just a great rock and roll band but I couldn't quite place them within this genre so I think those were the three that I kept like erasing yeah. and then we're trying to find a place for them and then you know it was just hard but those are kind of the three three other bands that I really wanted to kind of like pay some homage to but um for various reasons I didn't make it on my list when, when yep. i was going through my yeah. records last night i would slow down when i would go through the ac and i almost listened to an acdc last night i was like yes yeah, stay focused stay focused yeah. and then i was like and then of course like right after the acdc would be the aerosmith i'm like okay yeah, yeah. that seems kind of arbitrary too because our aerosmith's like pump is that's a that's a hair metal album basically yeah it's produced by bruce fairbain or somebody probably i don't remember it's produced by somebody that made like slippery when wet or so it's got the big yeah, drums yeah. it's doing As the thing yeah and i it's guess it's a like, totally arbitrary line that that pe somebody made yeah because yeah that's, you're right that's, you're, a, that's a great example yeah. of like a, a band evolving to fit the to fit the times yeah. you know yeah, right. it's, it's just interesting that you're right we did i wouldn't have thought of aerosmith i didn't even think of them i wouldn't have thought of them as a hair metal band but they totally would have just fit that it would have been, been but awesome. it wasn't their essence you know when i think about these bands i kind of went back to like what like is that the essence of who they were which i kind of that's why i started with metallica because i don't think that that's what they were but they were 80s they were metal and so yeah. i wanted to kind of transition from like the metal to like kind of getting more into like the glam so that was kind of the evolution of my list but i couldn't even place aerosmith there i just think they're yeah. a really great band and i love their music but i don't think their intention was never to be glam rock their intention was never to be that 80s metal but you know and when I listen to the songs of theirs that I like the most they all came out of like the or the mid to late 70s yeah. and so I'm like okay if that's the case then they're then I should classify them more in my head as more like classic rock but you know they yeah. definitely learned how to stay relevant yeah okay oh. so before we get into our number ones um I posted this morning on Facebook sometimes when I'm struggling for content I'll, I'll throw a bone 
out in Facebook world <laughs> and I'll see what, what I get back. So um, this morning I asked people what their, um, what their favorites were. And uh, here's a couple of responses we got on the old Facebook. Um, my good friend, uh, Tara Christian Wiedner, who is also from Bakersfield, but now lives in Seattle, um, said, I don't think we can talk hair metal without giving some nods to some nods or headbangs to Twisted Sister. Uh, Dan Scott, we all know and love him. <laughs> Shout at the devil strikes a good balance of rock and silliness for me. Hair metal bands can't take themselves too seriously, but still need to rock. Agreed. Um, Keith Lowell Jensen, uh, we all know, uh, great guy, has a great book called uh, Punching Nazis. Uh, Keith Lowell Jensen said the New York Dolls by the New York Dolls. We didn't even touch on that. And I think like the New York Dolls really heavily influenced uh, Twisted Sister. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they would have been a 70s band, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Alicia Rain, uh, I think a South Dakota comic. Uh, she also does some acting. Uh, Alicia Rain says uh, Firehouse, lesser known, yeah. but some fantastic songs. Also kind of, also kind of obscure Nelson. Yeah. I don't know that Forgot one. About Firehouse. I guys. have that Firehouse. Yeah, I Nelson. Firehouse, Firehouse, yeah. Uh, Drew Kimsey, uh, Europe, the final countdown. Yes. That's my daughter's <laughs> favorite one. We will play yeah. the final countdown. That's a good album too. Yeah, that's a great one. Okay, so that's what they had to say on Facebook. Let's see what we've got to say here. I don't, I'm, I'm just like, go Sarah. <laughs> this is your, this is your time. What for what's your, moment? what's your number one? Number one. Yes, let's do this. I have so much to say about this. So <laughs> not surprisingly, obviously, I got to go with Def Leppard, right? This was a no brainer. This was always going to be my number one. And then it came down to well, which album would I want to be number one, which got a little bit trickier. And the one that I chose is very, um, was very deliberate. Um, however, you know, they have so many great albums, right? And so along what you were saying earlier, Pyromania actually in 1983 could not break the number one spot because Michael Jackson's Thriller occupied that spot for weeks and weeks and weeks, right? But it was number two for a very, very long time. Um, and so Pyromania is a fantastic album and is really like, really just kind of like old school Def Leppard, right? However, my number one has to go to Def Leppard's Hysteria. Not just because a lot of their great hits are from that, but really the, and the reason why I really love Def Leppard is everything that they represent, right? So to me, not only are they what I think of when it comes to 80s kind of glam rock hair metal, but what this band has been through, through their entire like evolution since like the late seventies, to me, I admire them for, they're just like a great group of friends, number one. Number two, their resilience and the fact that they have gone through so much as a band, right? Um, between Rick Allen's accident, losing Steve Clark, mm -hmm. Vivian Campbell got can um, had Hodgkin's lymphoma in like 2011, 2012. And also the fact that like they love what they do and they're good at what they do, but they also kind of like take themselves seriously, but also don't take themselves too seriously, if that makes sense. You know, like they know who they are. They know that like they tried to change, right? And there's a lot of those albums in like the early mid nineties when kind of grunge was becoming a thing and they were trying to buy into that and it just wasn't happening. And if you were a loyal fan, you, you listened and you were like, good yeah. try guys, but <laughs> it just wasn't cutting it. But the reason why Hysteria to me will always be a classic is because that album got delayed. It came out after Rick's accident, right? And Rick Allen, I love him, right? Love him as a drummer and as a person. And I just, as a kid, he was always kind of the silly one in the group. So as a child, I kind of gravitated towards him. He was always funny and like barefoot and always wearing his like, you know, British flag underwear or whatever. So I always said he was funny. But what I loved is his strength and his resilience that he came out of that accident and was like, I'm going to learn how to play the drums in spite of having lost my arm. And he, and in fact, the band 
came together and they changed the tempo of their music in order for Rick to be able to play with them and keep up, right? So if you listen to Pyromania, if you listen to the earlier ones, they have a lot of, their tempo was a lot faster and obviously he wasn't gonna be able to keep up. And if you listen to all of the songs on Hysteria, there's a very distinct difference in the timing um, and that he, it, they changed it. They changed their sound in order to keep the band together in order to have Rick be able to play with them, which I just love, right? That they just supported each other. On top of that, a lot of people don't know this, but he also does a lot of philanthropic work supporting people with disabilities. Um, you know, uh, people who come, uh, troops who've lost, um, you know, limbs in, in wars, um, children who are born with congenital abnormalities, which I just love, right? Obviously it's gonna like tug on my heartstrings. Um, and then the fact that they lost Steve, right? And this is the Hysteria tour was the last one that Steve was on with them. And that Vivian has actually bid with the band longer than Steve has, right? And that it wasn't take Steve's place, right? He has his own sound. He has his own talent. He's a great guitarist. And it wasn't just adopt, you know, be a fill-in for Steve. They really embraced him as part of the band. And I think that that's what Hysteria to me, besides being a great album, and I love every single one of the songs on there, also really just kind of embodies what it means to be kind of a brotherhood, right? Of, of, of bandmates that are like, we have been through hell and back. We have seen the worst of it. We've had loss, physical loss, emotional loss, like so much. And yet they came together, they made an amazing album, they toured the hell out of it and they continue to show up. And my favorite thing is whenever they finish their concerts, they always say, don't forget us because we won't forget about you. And like, they know that, you know, they know that they're older. They know that like, there's only certain people who listen to them, but they show up for their fans and they give you a damn good show. And they take you through the nostalgia. They bring you some new music. And it's just an amazing experience. So I just cannot say enough about how much I love Def Leppard, if that isn't obvious, how much I love that album because what it represents in the like life of their band um, and just who they are as people. They're just like, they've had the sex, drugs and rock and roll, but they're just genuinely good people. They, they've lived through the time and they are who they are and they're not apologetic about it. Um, and you know, everyone would assume like pour some sugar on me is my go-to karaoke, but actually my favorite song from that album is run riot. And so if you haven't heard it, it is an amazing song. It's probably their fastest song relative to the other ones. It is great. I love the guitar riff. It is so much fun. If you need to pick me up, that is the song that I listen to that immediately turns my frown upside down. And like, it's just such a great album. So <laughs> I, I, always I, forever will be my number one. That, that speech like almost brought a tear to my eye, so <laughs> I really was waiting for you it. to say, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to induct <laughs> Def Leppard into that. Yes, they yeah. should be. <laughs> that was, uh, and, uh, and real quick note, one time uh, a friend of mine was teasing me about how old I was, and he said, man, you guys, Jesse's so old, he remembers when Def Leppard's drummer had two arms. <laughs> <laughs> And then they were like, what? But yeah, um, I don't think there's anything I can say about Def Leppard that you didn't already say. Yeah, that's um, good. I would definitely have had a Def Leppard album on my list, but I wanted to give you all the Def Leppard thunder. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, because I, that's, I knew that's where it belonged. And yeah, and I was also kind of like, well, what's the better, what's, what's the album to recognize? Mm -hmm. Is it Hysteria or is it Pyromania? And I think like, I love Pyromania more, but Hysteria is what made everybody a Def Leppard fan, right. you know, um, up until that point. And they were just everywhere on MTV, pour some sugar on me. And, and you know what, it, what made me recognize them as like, because by that point they'd been together for a while is, the song Rocket, mm -hmm. in the video, they kind of pay homage to like the glam scene of the 70s. They like give shout outs to uh, uh, Ziggy yep. Stardust. Mm -hmm. And um, I think like in the video, there's like references to like T-Rex. So yeah. um, they, they recognize the, the sound that, the, that they were a part of the evolution of. Absolutely. Um, yeah. What, you know, with the drummer thing, like I want to like, how you say that they changed their sound to to make room for him this was what their third album fourth album fourth 
I think it was hysteria was their fourth. Okay. There's, so yeah, let yeah. I, I, the point I wanted yeah. to make I'm was that Pyromania. like a band of brothers that have been together getting ready to put out their fourth album, they made the changes necessary to keep their family together. But mm -hmm. what do you think if it had been like getting ready to release their debut album? Do you think it would have been a different story? Like, I don't, I see a band getting ready to release their first album and that kind of tragedy happening to them saying, look, we, we got to do what's best for the band and we got to get a drummer. Mm -hmm. you, but I don't see it with the band that's been together that long um, and, and putting out this album that, that they knew that it was going to be um, the, uh, the huge success. I think I also, um, this is the appropriate time to like give a shout out to Mutt Lang. Yeah, I was gonna say that. Yeah, go, you want to say that? Go for it. You yeah, no, I was so glad props? you brought him up. Yeah, Robert John Mutt Lang produced like all the awesomest albums of the '80s. Or late yep. say he did. He did Back in Black, and he did uh, the Cars Heartbeat City. He did. Mm -hmm. uh, he did the three Def Leppard albums in the '80s, and he did a whole bunch. I think the Brian Adams album. But he's yeah, he's instrumental in the in the sound of of those albums. Yeah, I want I want Mutt Lang money, man. How much? Oh do you yeah, think that guy Retired has. Retired to the Alps or whatever he lived in when he when him yeah. and Shania Twain were together. They like moved to the the Alps and lived in the mountains and. And, <laughs> and he produced Shania before. Twain's albums. Yeah, he produced Shania Twain's albums, yeah. and they're they're phenomenal. Yeah, they have yeah. that arena sound. Yeah, yeah, they're great. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing is that, you know, there was a big time lag between Pyromania and Hysteria, and they totally could have died. And they literally, like, that album resuscitated them because yep. it happened right after, um, you know, Rick's accident. So they, they ended up having this huge lag, I think, from 84 to, like, 87 when the album came out. Yep where they could have just fizzled away, right? Yeah. I mean, like talk of ages, better to the burnout than fade away. They could have totally just faded away, but they didn't and they came back with, it's, it was such a comeback album and yeah. such a comeback tour. And I think their longest tour, in fact. Um, and so I think that's the other thing that speaks to it being a really great album because imagine all, after going through all of that and then the band kind of comes together is limping along and trying to figure this out. They could have had kind of a dud album, but they didn't. And it took a lot because everyone was kind of starting to forget about them. They were no longer relevant. And then they came back, they matched the sound that was going on in 80, 86, 87. And not only that, they blew it out of the water. Oh, yeah. So I think that speaks to the quality of the album itself, aside from all the kind of mushy gushy stuff that I mentioned, the sound of the album is also what kept it, what elevated it to, you know. It's, it's, de it's definitely the sound of 80s arena rock. Like yeah. you can't yeah. like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Her yeah, uh, hysteria is the is the pet sounds of hair metal. It's oh, like there the, you go. It's hysteria. Like this, this brilliantly produced uh, piece of work yes. that nothing else sounds like. Even if you listen to like the B sides and other shit they recorded for that album, they don't sound oh, wow because they 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 don't sound the same because they don't have the full muttling production the way that they were doing it, the full process they were going through. Right. Uh -huh. But yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, I would definitely. Have, I, I I tried to like just list a couple of things that Mutt Lang did, but you can't list just a couple no, of no, things yeah. that Mutt Lang did. Like yeah. it just no, goes yeah. on and on and on and on. Yeah, Mutt Lang could have just made Back in Black, and you would he would be remembered forever because Back in Black is so like Back in Black sounds like it was made now, mm -hmm. it's from nineteen eighty. It still sounds amazing. And that's all. That that's another comeback album. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. he like he knew how to. That might be the ultimate '80s comeback album. Really. Yeah, he knew I how mean. to. He knew how to not only keep that band sound, but how to resuscitate it and uh, yeah. and give it new life. So, and he did that. So he did that with with uh, Back in Black, and he did that with uh, Hysteria. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Marco. Uh, you, Sarah, are you done with Def Leppard? <laughs> I am. I'm good. I'm good. I, I feel all of all of my love has gone out there. So I thank you for giving me my stage. Yeah. No, it's definitely that was all you, uh, Marco. You're number one. All right. So I like I said, I was splitting the difference on this, which I think was a mistake because we're doing hair metal. But I never got to do a metal podcast or podcast about this. So I was like, I want to mention ones that I like. Just put them in there. <laughs> Uh, if we're doing hair metal, uh, uh, number one, just just Sarah just said it. Um, uh, if I was to make a hair a list of '80s like what I, what you would consider hair metal, the top three would just be High and Dry, Pyromania, and Hysteria, because those are my three go-to '80s albums. 
for like for anything so i also absolutely love def leppard i was gonna say my number one same thing the only album i ever spent like too much money on i have this ridiculous box set of def <laughs> yes. leppard uh, wow. uh this thing is really cool it comes with like a poster and a bunch of stuff but yeah my number one is also def leppard's hysteria i love every track on that album it is what yeah what i forget what it was there was something where sarah mentioned uh uh let it go i think oh, and yeah. i was like what who, who else knows this song what's Love going on song. here so i was all excited to, to do this podcast especially because like sarah knows about def leppard that's rad and so <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah sarah and i was the same way too i was like what sarah knows about <laughs> def leppard this is yeah this- yeah. It's great. Yeah. No, so I, I definitely, yeah. Hysteria is my number one uh, ad- far and away. It is just a perfect sound. It's the one that sounds the best. It's it's this crazy uh, perfect album. I think it was the most expensive album of all time when it was made too. It cost like $4 million. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I think that's part of my notes. <laughs> yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, but just the amount of time that they spent on it. Like I said, I think it's a, a Mutt Lang is like this weird genius guy who spends like obsessive amounts of time months making drums sound right. Like they would spend like a month on drums on everything. I, so I got like to keep big, talking. I got to step away. Keep talking. Oh. <laughs> I thought I heard a sound. I was like, oh I no. Think, I think his dog might need to get let out. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was like a person who was like, hey, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> it's like, oh no, somebody's bothering him while he's recording a podcast. That's the worst time to bother somebody. I know, oh. right? We have gone on for quite a bit, but I'm having- I was like, wondering. I was like, how long- I'm having the time go? of my life. This is so yeah. much fun. Yeah, no, I was excited about this. I actually, uh, uh, I think I was going to ask Jesse about it because we're, they're doing the Comedy Spot Film Festival. So oh, when we yeah. or film 24 hour film, what, no, no, whatever it is, it's uh, make, have a month to make a movie. Yeah. So uh, whenever we discussed this originally, they were like, oh yeah, you're going to, you want to do it on this date? I'm like, yeah, whatever. That's like a month from now. I'll be open. I'll make sure to have that open. But we, we were shooting our movie today so i was like oh, oh, guys, i gotta leave i gotta go and then we'll come back later so i was trying to make sure like how when am i coming back i'm gonna do it we got a whole movie to make uh which hopefully is fine i think jesse's doing it so i wanted to ask him how his was going uh but- nicole and i are doing it i we're doing this whole thing where we're gonna we're recognizing the time that we're living in and we're not ever being physically together we're social distancing nicole uh-huh. eichenberg we're social distancing, fin- filming this movie. She's shooting then sending me her scenes and then I'm editing and then we're adding audio. So it's going. It's, I've never made a movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've... <laughs> yeah, I've, n- I've never made a movie. I have no idea what it is to make a movie. Um, but there was a time when I had no idea how to do a podcast. So yeah, I don't know. no, that's cool. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So that's we're exciting. Do- it's coming along. Man, Def Leppard Hysteria. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. I agree. High and Dry and Pyromania are fantastic albums. Yeah. I mean, they are that is like the, the essence of their sound. Yeah. No, um, and, and as big of a Def Leppard fan as I am, like, and I have seen them live. I got to see them, I think, yeah. on the X tour. So uh and I love I love Def Leppard. Uh, yeah, uh a slang, not 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 the best, but it has a couple yeah. of great songs. I do love uh Adrenalize. Adrenalize, uh, I'm you know, I'm and- getting a new appreciation for it. I didn't like yeah. it first came out right um but now i'm like starting to appreciate it and i like listen to the songs i was like oh i think i maybe judge them too harshly yeah, adrenaline is like a it's a good album like the other three yeah. are amazing and that one's solid and uh and that was a yeah. hard album because that was their first Even one without my... steve clark and it was it was just hard it was yeah, i think I was still kind of grieving so um it was a Sorry, weird a... album What's yeah that? no no and i was gonna say because vivian campbell is dio's dr- guitarist Oh, yeah, on, yeah, on, on, uh, on holy diver and his yeah. first three solo albums which and he's an amazing guitarist on those albums right. so i didn't know this till later but yeah yes. and i always felt like he didn't get to do something awesome like i like their other albums but they're not like like x is weird because it's like a right. pop album and and uh the songs from the sparkle lounge is okay mm-hmm. and it's like right. they're okay but they, they never got there again and i was like he's been there for like 20 years being like cool on stage it's like they gotta get a good album they're always trying yeah. Their self-titled one they were trying their ass off to make the to make the comeback and it's like ah uh, it's not it's, it's almost it's it's good yeah and yeah <laughs> anyway i love def leopard i uh big hey. hello kitty mug please thank you pin i made <laughs> coffee like when we started and i was boiling water the whole time and i'm like oh god oh god i gotta stop that and my daughter came in it's like you're boiling water i'll get it 
And then she came in and was like, I was like, could you just stop it? I'm not going to get it. And so I started it again once Once uh, we, we took a break. So nice. anyway, I'm sorry. Oh, Jesse, okay. you guys say your number one. Yeah, yeah. My, my number one. Okay, so my number one, I went back and forth on this. I'm so glad that I let Sarah talk about Def Leppard because I wanted to talk about Def Leppard. I'm so glad somebody else talked about Guns N' Roses because I was just trying to like, just make this as broad as possible. And then when we get down to the top five, I think it's kind of, it's kind of already laid laid out for us. I think it's going to be pretty easy. Uh, but my number five, and this is a band who like, I'm not sure what album this is in their catalog. It's deep in their catalog, but they evolved to the times. They saw what MTV was doing for metal and they saw what Hairspray was doing for metal. They saw like what these, what this like stadium sound was doing for it. So they said, let's do our version of this and be better than all of that. And it is, I think, probably not, well, not topping Guns N' Roses or Def Leppard, one of the highest selling records of, uh, on this list, but is a White Snake's self-titled album, White Snake. Oh, which, cool. Which came out in March, March of 1987, right? Eight million copies, five singles. Five singles, uh, Still of the Night, Crying in the Rain, Here I Go Again, Is This Love, Give Me All Your Love. It reached number two on the Billboard charts, and uh, Whitney Houston kept them out of the number one spot with her second <laughs> album. But of course, um, you can't you can't think of 1980s music videos and not uh, think of uh, Tani Katane in the white dress uh, yep. dancing. And um, but David Coverdale, very long history, right? We've already mentioned uh, people that he's played with. Uh, he was he was in Deep Purple. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I think he was, uh, you're right. Uh, him, that Steve Purple's had a couple of singers. Yeah. Uh, he was in a, a whole bunch. Yeah. He had a long, weird history of, uh, I only recently got a White Snake album from the early 80s when they were more like a blues band. And I was completely unfamiliar with the idea that they were like an entirely different band. And that's the one where he was like, nope, we're doing this new thing. We're going to, we're going to have a <laughs> modern sound. Yeah. We're going to make a lot of money for once. He said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to try something new where we make money on a record. And, um, and so that's where we're going to go with it. All right. That is my number one. And um, that's a great album. Let me just say that what, what, okay, well, we're going to try to compile the top five um, that Def Leppard hysteria was mentioned twice. <laughs> Uh, Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction was mentioned twice. And then uh, Twisted, I Sister, think Twisted was Sister was also mentioned oh, yeah. twice. Yeah. So if we just play the numbers and say that, like, speaking to the data, this is obviously what rose to the top, then here is, like, probably our one, two, and three, where they're going to fall. We'll talk about that in a second, Right. But if we say that with, with what we talked about, these definitely got to be on the list, Def Leppard, Guns N' Roses, and Twisted Sister, are you guys okay with those three absolutely, absolutely. being in the top five? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then what? I'm telling you, four and five are the bitch. Like they yeah. are really hard <laughs> to figure out. So who's not making the list? I'll just say it. Um, well, Right now they're not on the list, but if you want to, if you want to state your battle for one of these, let's we're going to get there in a second. Metallica's Black Album, Bon Jovi's Slippery When Wet, Van Halen's 1984, Black Sabbath Mob Rules, Judas Priest Screaming uh, Screaming Fire, uh, Rat Out of the Cellar, Poison Open Up and Say Ah, Motley Crue and White Snake. Oh, see, yeah. Well, I would get rid right. of the the ones I put on there. Judas Priest and Black Sabbath shouldn't be on a hair metal list. Okay. <laughs> I was just excited think, to do a podcast. I think you can take along those lines. I think you can take Metallica off as well. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I. Uh, but the other ones, yeah. That that White Snake album is really good. That uh, that Poison album is good. Those are those are solid. And and what Slippery When Wet is is like the the big one. You know, that's one of the the big ones. No, but I'm debating between. You know, if I had to choose between Van Halen and Bon Jovi, I feel like, I feel like I would keep Van Halen. 
No. Oh, see, I would I would have thought Bon Jovi just because they're the I, I they're keep, the 80s sound. So I want to oh, keep. Okay. I, I I'm just gonna vocalize how I'm feeling. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to keep Bon Jovi. Okay. And uh, Poison. I like okay. Poison. My, one of the I ones like almost poison. on my list would have been uh, if I had not put re- like metal albums on there and it only stuck to hair metal uh, like I should have. I, I agree. Put, yeah, if I, I was put that strictly going to do hair metal, it would have been I would have had Poison and um, yeah. White Snake on there as well. Yeah, okay. would have been Open Up or Say Ah or Look with the Cat. Uh, okay, dress. and then so then do we want to start? Do we want to put at number five? Do we want to put Poison there or Bon Jovi there? I would put the poison one there personally. I mean, I, it's kind of like it depends if you're making like a super list. Uh, I bought Jovi Slippery and Wet's hard to, but you know, that's not going to be passed by too many. I guess poison's got, it does have every rose has a thorn. That might be the uh, the ultimate 80s ballad, like, or like, like that. Acoustic it might be. Ballad. Yeah. I mean, even if it's not your favorite, it just might be the one. Yeah. Of, so, the, of the acoustic guitar ballad. Because so everyone's junior high. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So then make out song dance like whatever. <laughs> so then are we okay with saying this this might this list might have just made itself and it, it, there might not be any any debating back and forth but I'm okay with that. Uh number 5 Poison open up and say ah. Number 4 Bon Jovi Slippery When Wet. Number 3 Twisted Sister Stay Hungry. Number 2 Guns N' Roses Appetite for Destruction and number 1 Def Leppard. Or yeah. do I love you- it. I would do that. I would, I would, I would say that that is a, that is a damn fine list right there. Yep. I think the aliens would have a very good appreciation for yep. they, 80s they hair metal. They will know what hair metal is. They will know. That is our <laughs> list. So, so then our number one hair metal band, hair metal album of the eighties, we're agreeing on hysteria. That's awesome that you have it. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. I love it. Hysteria. It's That's a great, rad. it's a great record, and it's such a great sound. And pour some sugar on me was just definitely the video to come home and watch videos to, and it was going to be on because MTV was always counting down the top videos or something like and that. That was always, I was going to say because Sarah said uh, "Run Rioters" her favorite song. I, I would say "Excitable." I love "Excitable." Oh yeah, that is. I'm going to have to give this album a, a listen to today and, and listen it's to great. the deep cuts oh, that you guys are talking so about. It's so good, Jesse. Yeah. It's so good. I listen yeah. to it like. Anytime I'm feeling down, if I listen to that album, I immediately feel good. Pour some sugar on me. That music video is the reason why my parents canceled MTV in our house. It was because <laughs> they thought it was too like sexy, suggestive. And it was right around the time that I was young enough that I was also a really big fan of obviously of Michael Jackson and Dirty Diana had come out. Ooh. And like, I was really into Michael Jackson and that scene <laughs> where he like rips his shirt. And so my mom was watching me and she's like, she's she's way into this whole dirty diana pour some sugar on me dynamic <laughs> like this isn't good for a five-year-old like i don't know what's going on and they canceled um they canceled mtv that's hilarious uh, yeah that, that's yeah because they thought it was a bad influence i mean apparently i was i was too excitable apparently but um. well, appar- <laughs> apparently apparently sir the good influence in your house was your older brother yeah who, absolutely um last week uh one of the guests on my podcast was um alicia Uribe, who back and back then I think was Alicia Perez, and she knew she's friends with your brother. Oh yeah, that's right. We made that connection. Yeah, yeah Mark is so crazy. My Alicia and my brother went to high school together, so they actually ended up. We reconnected them through Facebook through me and Jesse's friendship. Isn't that so random? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's so random. Yeah, and she's married to my best friend from from grade school. You know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. And it, it's just crazy. Like. I don't know. You guys, this was super fun. Here is our top five list one more time. Poison, open up and say, ah, Bon Jovi, Slippery When Wet, Twisted Sister, Stay Hungry, Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction, and Def Leppard Hysteria. That's great. That is a fantastic perfect. list. I um, couldn't ask for a more perfect list. Yeah. You know, yeah. You, know you guys, this, this was the first time that the three of us worked together. And I don't know, it's kind of like a first date. We're like, at the end of the first date, you're like, <laughs> Hey, this was fun. Uh, can we see each other again? Um, so I, I'm kind of asking you guys right now, uh, Sarah, could you hold your own on a Guns N' Roses podcast? Ooh, um, maybe. I, I, I'm going to do. have to do a lot more. I'll do more of a deep dive. Um, I was also going to say, if you ever decide to do an 80s alternative, um, 
uh, podcast featuring, you know, Depeche Mode and The Cure and, and all that, I, and or a 90s grunge. I'm there. I'm right okay, there. You know what? That that might be a way to get you and Alicia on a podcast together. Oh, that'd be fun. And then maybe me and Marco can go down the Guns N' Roses rabbit hole with somebody else. Let's do, let's, let's play with great. these ideas. And yeah. um, thank you so much for your time. And uh, now the, now the work really begins for me because I get to, I get to start yeah. editing this <laughs> and uh, taking it down and Thank you so much. Um, you guys want to do plug anything? Sarah, you want to tell us? Marco, you want to plug what you're working on? And Sarah, you maybe want to just sure. tell us how careful we got to keep being. Oh yeah. yeah. No, that's a good. Oh no, I was gonna like I say I, I'm working on the movie. I got to go leave right after this to go finish the Sacramento Comedy Spot uh, 30 Days to Make a Movie Challenge thing that's going on. So we're we're shooting a thing. Kevin's gonna be Kevin Cooley's gonna be standing around in a wizard costume, and I gotta I gotta film him. <laughs> nice so that's what i'm working on right I now i can't wait to see that that's gonna yeah, be awesome I, I i know nicole and i are in there with all these heavy hitters of like that have really done this and are really good at it but i don't know we're kind of just happy to be in this in the same room as you guys so all no, right. it's awesome yeah. yeah if there's any way to collaborate i haven't figured out the collaboration i know there's like a thing where they're like there's a meet there's like a group so yeah, this is a group. no. If there's anything like, that this you need anything or if you want to help, like it just not in like I'm like I'm an, an expert or something, but it's like if there's like anything I would love to like do something. I just don't know how to do it, and you know, like how to how to bother other people about it. Like, what are you doing? What, yeah, what are you no, doing? Yeah, there's like, a face, there's a Facebook group for it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's right. cool. yeah. Sarah, what do you got to say? Yeah, I'm really excited. So the Hypothetics, we are dabbling in character sketches, actually. So we did a little like nugget on Brian Crawl Live with some characters that we have been working on on, on our own. And it's kind of like a dating advice type show um, as these characters who um, don't give great advice, but they seem to think that they do. So mm -hmm. it's called Chicks Fix and Chill. And Brian um, is going to have us on March 12th at 7.30. So we're going to do the full kind of like hour, hour long program um, of, yeah, our characters um, getting together and kind of talk show style, kind of, you know, uh, what was the one with, um, uh, what was the one show with, uh, oh my God, I can't remember what it was. It was on MTV for a while. Anyways, it was like the dating advice show um, that often didn't give very good dating advice. So anyways, that's what we're going to be doing March 12th, 730 on um, the Sacramento Comedy Spot um, live stream. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. All right, guys, I'll let you get to your days. I know you got a lot to do. Thanks again <laughs> for spending the, spending the morning with me and drinking coffee and talking about 80s Thank hair you metal. for having yeah. us. It's yeah, so that, much was, fun. that was great, Jesse. I, I love this. This is awesome. All right. And I'll, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Sounds Thanks. good. Right. Bye. Bye. Take care.